Hi there. So next we move on to chapter 18, superposition and standing waves. If you look at the images we have on the screen, on the left we have um, a, a picture got to do with standing waves. So we have a string that's vibrating in three different ways, setting up standing waves. On the right we have a speaker which is breaking a glass and this concept relates to resonance. These are two principles which we will be looking at in this uh, chapter. But after this uh, chapter, this is what we should be able to do. Derive the superposition of two harmonic waves and discuss the interference which occurs. Derive an expression describing a standing wave and discuss the nodes and antinodes that occur. Obtain an expression for the vibrational frequency at which nodes occur in a string. Explain the following terms, the fundamental frequency, overtones, the harmonic series, uh, quality of sound and beats. We also need to take a look at the phenomenon of resonance and then we're going to be uh, looking at the vibrational frequencies that can occur in a pipe and we're going to be looking at two different um, conditions. The one is with the pipe open at uh, both ends and the second case is with a pipe open at one end and closed at the other end and of course solving problems on each of these uh, topics. Uh, when we have a sort of a wave set up, for example a wave on a string, there are a number of different like boundary conditions uh, as we call them. These are initial um, conditions that, that set constraints on, the, on what can physically happen. And as a result of uh, these boundary conditions, we're going to see that so only certain frequencies can exist. And we say that these frequencies are quantized. So when we refer to something being quant quantized, we're referring to only certain values are allowed. And uh, quantization, it's in fact a very important concept in physics. It has to do, for example, with quantum mechanics, where we deal with um, the the probability of a particle in a box, we also find that the solutions to, to, to that problem are quantized according to the boundary conditions. And in this chapter we're going to use quantization and we're going to understand a range of different phenomena including how musical instruments um, based on strings and columns of air behave. Um, we're also then going to look at the combination of uh, waves um, how do different waves having different frequencies add together or how do they superimpose uh, upon uh, one another? The first principle we're going to be dealing with is the superposition principle and this has got to do with you know, interference of waves. So the combination of separate waves in the same region of space uh, to produce a resultant wave is called interference. So this is saying that if we have um, two waves and they move into the same area in space, they interfere with one another. And if we want to understand what the resultant wave is going to look like, then we need to rely on the superposition principle. And the superposition principle states, if two or more traveling waves are moving through a media, the resultant value of the wave function at any point is the algebraic sum of the individual value of the wave functions of the individual waves. So the superposition principle gives us a rule how to, to add two waves that are interfering with one another. So here we have two examples of this, well examples of the superposition principle and we're going to see how to apply the superposition principle First in the case of constructive interference and secondly in the case of destructive interference. Firstly for constructive interference, see we have two wave functions. The first wave is described by Y1, the second wave is described by Y2, Y1, Y2. These two waves are moving uh, towards each other and when the, the individual pulses overlap, 
what we need to do is we need to add the two waves together to find out what the resultant is and we add it uh, point wise so each little point of y1 will be added to each little point of y2 given this overall uh, shape here you can see this is as the two waves are moving together when the pulses overlap the wave function is the sum of the individual waves um, here you can see the, the pulses are completely overlapping their line on top of uh, one another. So here we have maximum amplitude of the resultant wave. For example, if this wave had height um, 2 at this point and this uh, wave had height 3 units, then at this point here it would be 2 plus 3, it would be 5. This wave would be 5 high. high. And then afterwards, when the pulses no longer overlap, they've moved apart, then we see no permanent uh, effects from the interference. So this is a case of constructive interference because the, the two waves have added together and created a, a result which is bigger th than the individual uh, waves. The second um, example of the superposition principle, we look at destructive interference. And here you can see that we have individual pulses and what one pulse is positive it's a hump in the positive direction and the second uh, pulse is is negative in the sense that it's it's below the y-axis right and when these two two waves over overlap you can see they've uh, moved together now as they move closer together then we end up with again we we add the the the, the two waves together but in this case the waves cancel each other out so if this was a wave three high and this one was you know two high remember this is minus two it's in the negative direction and when we add the two together it will be three plus minus two it will give us a little wave which is one high so here it says when the crests of the two pulses align the amplitude is the difference between the individual amplitude um, amplitudes they, they've cancelled out and once again we can see when the pulses move apart they have no permanent uh, effect on the on the medium what we're interested to do now is to apply the superposition principle to add uh, two waves together and what we're going to be considering is the superposition of two identical waves y1 and y2 and they're going to be shown by blue and green colors respectively um, and they're going to be adding together and in, in each case they're going to be given a resultant wave which we're showing in a red uh, brown color and what we're interested in is is how does the resultant wave differ with the phase difference between y1 and y2 so in this first example the phase difference between y1 and y2 is zero degrees so this means that the the blue line y1 it lies exactly on top of the the green line y2 so the the two waves lie completely on top of one another they have the same amplitude they have the same phase so we can't uh, distinguish between them but when we add the two together we find that we get uh, constructive interference and we'll get a wave which is you know twice the amplitude of each of the two individual waves and has uh, the same phase in the second case we're looking at uh, y1 shown in blue and in this case we have y2 which has a phase difference of 180 degrees you can see it's completely out of phase and when we add the green and the blue lines together uh, we get a flat line so we get the resultant uh, being a flat wave and this this refers to then destructive interference the y1 and y2 they've cancelled out if you want to apply the superposition principle to see how that happened what you can do is you can add the the values point wise at this point here the the blue wave has value of zero the green wave has a value of zero zero plus zero is zero at this point here for example the the blue wave might have a maximum amplitude of two and the the green wave will have an amplitude of minus two so again it cancels out 
2 plus minus 2 is 0 and we get the 0 case here. So we see for a phase offset of 180 degrees we have complete uh, destructive interference. In the third case we have an angle between uh, 0 degrees and between uh, 180 degrees. So you can see we have an angle of phi equals to 60 degrees. We have the, the blue wave as before and now this green wave is shifted forward by uh, 60 degrees. And when we add these two waves together we get the, the red brown wave shown and this is an intermediate result. It's neither constructive nor destructive interference. Um, it's the, the maximum amplitude isn't as high as this value, right? But it isn't a zero. So we have an intermediate uh, result. So we've just seen um, by means of pictures how two waves with different phases add together. But now we have a look at how do we mathematically express that. So according to this, um, we're going to look at the superposition of sinusoidal waves using a mathematical approach. So let's apply the, superpos the principle of superposition to two sinusoidal waves traveling in the same direction in a linear medium. So these are the two waves we're going to be using, Y1 and Y2. They're going to be traveling in the same direction. So remember this, this sign in front of the omega t tells us which direction it's traveling. So this has a negative sign, so it means it's traveling to the right. This wave also has a negative sign, so it's also traveling to, to the right. If the two waves are traveling to the right and have the same frequency, wavelength and amplitude, but differ in phase, we can express their individual functions as these two wave functions. So you can see the two um, waves, they have the same frequency, they, have this, they share the same omega, they have the same wavelength, which in, in effect means that they have the same wave number, they have the same amplitude, for each of them the amplitude is A, but the important difference between them is they differ in phase. You see this one has a phase off this one has a phase offset of phi relative to this one. So this is why we say that they they differ in phase. This one has plus phi and this one doesn't have anything anything in that point. Applying the superposition principle then the superposition principle tells us when we want to add two waves, we simply add their wave functions algebraically. So the resultant wave Y is um, Y1 plus Y2 and adding these two functions will, will give us this. See we've taken out A as, as a common factor. Now we make use of a trigonometric identity to simplify this expression. And this um, expression says that if you have sine of A plus sine of B, then the resultant is, is given by this uh, expression. So this isn't an identity that you need to remember. If you need to use it, you'll be given it. But for us, you can see we have um, our first wave is uh, this shown here. So for us, A is going to be kx minus omega t. B is going to be kx minus omega t plus phi. So we make use then of this trigonometric identity and this gives us the, the following results. As I've pointed out the values of A and B. When we substitute those into the previous equation then we get the resultant wave y is equal to 2a cos of this term times sine of, of this term. So this is a, um, an overall expression for the resultant uh, wave. This tells us how the resultant wave will um, vary with position and time and also the phase offset. This, this expression, it's a very rich expression. There's a lot of detail we can extract from it and this, this detail is provided in the discussion below. 
The result has several important features. The resultant wave function y also is sinusoidal and has the same frequency and wavelength as the individual waves because the sine function incorporates the same values of k and omega that appear in the original wave functions. So what they're referring to here is they're saying here we also have an expression it's also got a, a part of it is sine of kx minus omega t plus phi. They're referring in this first sentence to 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 this this term. They're saying it also has the same value of k, the same wave number, the same frequency, and the um, some phase offset here given by phi over two. The amplitude of the resultant wave is 2a cos of phi over 2 and its phase constant is phi over 2. So um, here they're referring to the fact that we have a sine wave. Remember everything in front of the of the sine function is its amplitude. So for us its amplitude is going to be given by this 2a cos of phi over 2. This whole thing in front of the sine is the amplitude now and when they say that our wave has a phase constant of phi over 2 they're referring to this term here this is the the phase constant right if the phase constant phi of the original wave equals 0 then cos of um, phi over 2 equals cos of 0 equals to 1 and the amplitude of the resultant wave is 2a twice that of the amplitude of either individual waves. So they're saying if the two waves um, are perfectly in phase, remember before we had the green wave and the blue wave in the picture, if they're in phase, then it means that phi is equal to zero and the amplitude that we're going to have is given by this term. So this will be 2a cos of zero, so it will be 2 times a cos of 0 is 1, so the amplitude will be 2a, twice that of the amplitude of either individual waves. In this case, the crests of the two waves are in the same location in space, and the waves are said to be in phase everywhere and interfere constructively. Let's actually flip back and, and have a look at what they're referring to. They're referring to this case here see phi zero the two waves are in phase and um, everywhere they're interfering constructively and the amplitude is twice that of, of the individual wave uh, we saw it, seen it in the picture and we've also now seen it um, mathematically said to be in and um, the individual values of uh, the individual waves y1 and y2 combine to form uh, brown, the brown-red curve shown in, of amplitude 2a shown in the figure. We've just seen that. Because the individual waves are in phase, they are indistinguishable. We saw that we couldn't tell them apart, where they appear as a single blue curve. In general, constructive interference occurs when, whenever this term is equal to 1 or plus minus 1, whenever cos of phi is equal to plus minus one. So this is an important point. This is a crucial point that we'll have constructive interference uh, whenever cos of phi over two is equal to plus minus one. And this will occur when phi is equal to zero, two pi, four pi, and so forth. That is to say when phi is an even multiple of pi, we'll have constructive interference with um, this cos, cos of phi over 2 being 1 and the overall amplitude then being 2a. Uh, we're looking at a, a, a different case now when phi is equal to a pi radiance or any odd multiple of pi radiance then we'll have um, cos of phi over 2 being cos of pi over 2 and this will be 0. And in this case, we'll have the crest of one wave. It will occur at the same position 
as the trough of the second wave. So this case refers to the second figure where the crest of, of wave Y1, it occurs at the same position as the trough of wave, wave Y2. And we said in this case, we have in a destructive interference in the waves uh, canceling each other out. And we have this destructive interference whenever phi is equal to pi or any odd multiple of pi. So this is to say if it's one times pi, if it's three times pi, if it's five times pi. We have destructive interference and the resultant is zero. Finally, when the phase constant has any arbitrary value uh, between zero and pi, the resultant wave has an amplitude somewhere between zero and two A. This third uh, case refers to this picture here, where we didn't have a phase difference of pi or of sorry of zero or, or pi, but we had a phase difference of sixty degrees. And um, here the resultant is somewhere between the amplitude of each of these two waves. So if, if the amplitude of each wave is A, then this, this resultant amplitude over here will be somewhere between 0 and, and 2A. Has an amplitude whose value is somewhere between 0 and 2A. In the more general case in which the waves have the same wavelength, but different amplitudes, the results are similar with the following exceptions. In the in-phase case, the amplitude of the resultant wave is not twice that of the single wave, but rather the sum of the individual waves. And when um, the waves are pi radians out of phase, they do not completely cancel. Uh, and we won't have complete distraction. So this this uh, paragraph here is referring to the case of what if our green wave and our blue wave weren't the same amplitude? Uh, then this means that they won't completely cancel out. And when they add together, we won't have something you know of of magnitude two a. So I would encourage you to to work through the maths and read through this discussion carefully on your own and see if you can understand each of the, the critical points raised with relation to this equation shown here and how the equation relates back to the picture of the three cases shown here. So we have, you know, seen how two waves add together by making use of uh, pictures, diagrams. We've seen how to mathematically calculate uh, the resultant uh, waves. And now we look at how to actually build an experiment to measure the interference of waves. So we could build an experiment like this where we have a speaker. The speaker produces sound. The sound enters a pipe. And then the sounds will be traveling along two different paths. The first path is along the top. The second path is along the bottom. And then at this point where your ear is situated, we have interference between the two waves. We have interference along uh, between the sound wave that took the top path and interference between the wave that uh, took the, the bottom path. Note that this, this is an adjustable piece. It can be lifted up or, or moved down. And when we uh, lift this little gray piece up, we can change the path length of, of the top path. Um, you know, if we lift the, the gray piece up a bit, then we increase the path length of the top path. If we lower the gray part, we, we decrease the path length of the top part. So as shown, this is an acoustic demonstration for interference of sound waves. Half the sound energy travels in one direction, that's the top, and the other half travels in the opposite direction. The distance along any path from the speaker to the receiver is called the path length R. So we'll be referring to, to this distance here as R 
uh, 2 and the, uh, the lower path R1 is fixed so this is the distance R1 is fixed but the upper path R2 that's this path shown here uh, can be varied uh, by sliding the u-shaped tube I've already spoken about that this is similar to a trombone instrument and this gives rise to a path difference between the two paths delta r and we call uh, we express that as the you know the the absolute value of the the difference between the two lengths so we have two different um well, we have a number of different things that ca can occur but by adjusting the the path length in the upper arm we can either have constructive interference or we can have destructive interference for constructive interference we'll have this condition that the path length is equal to n lambda where n is equal to 0 1 2 3 4 so we have integral uh, multiples of lambda um, then we have in phase at the receiver and maximum sound for constructive interference for de destructive interference we'll have that occurring when um, the the path length delta r is equal to lambda over 2 lambda 3 lambda over 2 and so forth so whenever it's n lambda over 2 for odd multiples of lambda Let's take a look then at an example of doing a calculation of how different path lengths give rise to constructive and destructive interference. Two identical loudspeakers are placed three meters apart and they're driven by the same oscillator. A listener is originally at point O located eight meters from the center of the line connecting the two speakers. The listener then moves to point P which is a perpendicular distance 0 0.350 meters from O and she experiences the first minimum in the sound intensity. What is the frequency of the oscillator? So here we have our two speakers and as they said they separated by three meters. Um, someone's originally uh, situated at this point here O and then they start walking and they walk to point P and as they walk what happens is the path difference uh, between the two speakers changes you can see R2 is getting longer as they're moving up and uh, R1 is getting less and as they walk towards P the sound starts getting softer and when they reach P um, then the sound is is at a minimum and we asked to calculate what is the frequency at which each of these speakers are, are oscillating so the way we we go about that is we say that uh, we have two paths in our experiment these are r1 and r2 they have some path difference delta r which is the difference between the two um the two paths so it would be the absolute value of r2 minus r1 and um, the first minimum in the sound is going to occur when the difference in the path is equal to half a wavelength remember if the if the waves are are in phase then the phi difference the or the the phase difference is zero if the um if the waves are completely out of phase and we have destructive interference then the phase difference is uh, 180 degrees or pi and if if 360 degrees is um, 2 pi refers to one wavelength then 180 degrees for being out of phase refers to half a wavelength so for the first minimum for destructive interference we have the path difference is half a wavelength so what we can do is we can make use of this fact to calculate what is the 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 the, the, the path difference and to do that we make use of Pythagoras to calculate what is the length of R2 and what is the length of R1 you can see in in, in calculating for example what is the length of R2 I've used Pythagoras in 
this triangle shown um, let's see for this triangle shown here so we have r2 squared is equal to 8 squared plus 1.85 squared that allows us to calculate what r2 is by taking the square root similarly to calculate what r1 is r1 is going to be the square root of 8 squared which is this side of the triangle plus uh, 1.15 squared this is where these two two terms come from then we can calculate what the path difference is so it's 0 0.13 meters um, the condition that we have for destructive interference is that the path difference must be half a wavelength we've already spoken about that so setting up this condition this allows us to find out what lambda is allows us to find out what lambda is simply rearranging we see lambda is two times the path difference um, remember that we're not asked to calculate what uh, lambda is but the question asks us to calculate what is the frequency of the oscillator so to finish off the problem we use the the speed of sound to convert between uh, frequency and wavelength and we know that the speed of sound v is uh, lambda times frequency we've already found out what lambda is this allows us to calculate what the frequency is um, here i've used for v i've used the speed of sound in air and the answer then calculates out to be uh, the frequency is 1.3 kilohertz so each of these speakers has a frequency of 1.3 kilohertz so now we take a look at uh, standing waves on a string um, before we look at the maths it's in nice to look at these pictures and the definition of a standing wave uh, such as the one on a string is an oscillation pattern with a stationary outline that results from the superposition of two identical waves traveling in opposite directions and these are pictures of some uh, standing waves you can see we have a stationary outline it isn't as though the wave is moving to the left or to the right but instead as time passes by this point is moving up and then moving down so we have the stationary outline or, or this shape an important point to note is that these standing waves occur as a result of waves traveling in opposite uh, directions so if we look then, then at the maths involved, we're dealing with two identical waves traveling in opposite directions in the same media. So when the waves are identical, they're referring to the fact that um, the amplitude is the same for Y1 and Y2. The wave number is the same. As a result of that means that the wavelength is going to be the same. Um, you know, the 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 size of the angular frequency omega is the same but they're moving in opposite directions this one has a minus sign in front of omega meaning it's moving to the to the right this one has a plus sign meaning that it's moving to the left so they're traveling in opposite directions if we would like to add these two waves together and find out what the resultant interference is again we add them algebraically and this is this is the expression we get then if we make use of uh, trigonometric identity again this would be something we could look up in a table this tells us that if we add sine of um, a plus or minus b then uh, we get this expression showing uh, on the right so as a result of this the final uh, wave function that we get is is given by by this expression here y is equal to 2a sine of kx cos of omega t if we were to plot that we already see uh, we would have these standing uh, waves with stationary outlines and as time uh, changes we would you know move from from the dark pink down to the uh, white line and then back up 
like this if we had this standing wave. If we had this standing wave here, we would have a different set of boundary conditions, but it's also a standing wave similar to this wave here. It's also a standing wave with a different, different set of boundary conditions. In terms of the notation that, that we use, we refer to a node as these points where the zero occurs and an anti-node is the points where the maximum occurs. So the amplitude of the vertical oscillation of any element of the string depends on the horizontal position of that element. Each element vibrates within a confined envelope function 2a sine of kx. This relates to this expression that we've uh, seen um, here. This 2a sine of kx, it defines the envelope in which the vibration occurs. So for our creation of standing waves, we have two waves traveling in the opposite direction. We have um, wave Y1 traveling to the right and Y2, the green wave, traveling to the left. And as they move past each other, they add together, right? So at this time, they're going to add together and we're going to give this, uh, we're going to have this wave um, as shown here, where we have nodes, which are points at which the zero occurs. And then we have anti-nodes, which are the, the points of, of maximum interference on the wave. Then uh, this would be at a snapshot at time t equals to zero. As time uh, passes by, we would come to time t equals capital T over 4. Capital T is the period. And at this point, the two waves will be, uh, that they will have moved such that they're completely out of phase. Uh, phi is equal to 180 degrees or pi. When they add together, we get complete destructive interference and we get a, a zero line then as time uh, moves by again they you know move move relative to each other and we get the addition once again uh, giving rise to this envelope so as as time goes by we move from having a wave shown like as shown here to having a wave with complete destructive interference to this wave then having inverted uh, phase relative to, to, to this wave shown here. And this is, uh, this explains why we see these uh, patterns in, in this figure here. Having a look then at the function, at the function, the result that we uh, derived. Remember, this was an expression for for the resultant uh, wave function for a standing wave. Uh, let's have a look at it, uh, analyze it. This expression does not contain the function kx uh, minus omega t. Here we just have an omega t. There's no kx minus omega t, and because it's not of this form, it means that it's an expression for a single traveling uh, wave motion. Uh, when you observe a standing wave, there's no sense of motion in the direction of propagation of either of the original waves. So you, it's not as though the wave is moving to the left or moving to the right. Um, it's simply a standing wave, which is where the name comes from. If we analyze this expression and we're interested in to find the position of the nodes, remember those are the points with zero uh, displacement, then the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion of elements of the media has a minimum value of zero when x satisfies the condition that sine of kx is equal to zero. So if we're interested in having a node, then we need the amplitude term to be zero this 2a sine of kx to be zero. That will only occur when sine of kx is zero. And you can check for yourself. Um, this occurs when kx is equal to zero, two, pi, two pi, three pi. So here we see integral multiples of pi. If you draw a sine graph for yourself, then you'll see that 
that that's that this is the case because k is equal to 2 pi over lambda that comes from the definition of uh, the wave number these values of k uh, the values of kx then give x is equal to 0 x is equal to pi over 2 pi 3 pi over 2 and so forth or writing it generally uh, we have um, x is equal to n pi over 2 with n equal to 0 1 2 and 3 so this gives the position of the antinodes the position where the wave function is 0 these points shown here if we would like to calculate those positions we need to know the wavelength of the um, original um, wave and then we use different inter integers to find each of, of, of the um, nodes um, similarly if we're interested to know the positions of, of anti nodes or maximum displacement then this occurs when uh, the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion of elements of the media has a maximum value or when x satisfies the condition such that sine of kx is equal to plus 1 or minus 1. Again, we've used the definition of the wave number k is equal to 2 pi over lambda to move from this expression over here to this expression over here. So we have the position of the antinodes or the maximum displacement is n lambda over 4. If we would like to verify what's written in this uh, beige color block, the distance between two adjacent antinodes is given by lambda over 2. If you subtract any two adjacent antinode positions, so if you go 5 lambda over 4 minus 3 lambda over 4, then you get lambda over 2. The distance between two adjacent nodes is also equal to lambda over 2. You can find that by subtracting any of these two adjacent numbers. For example, lambda minus a half lambda is a half lambda or lambda over 2. And you can check for yourself that the distance between a node and an adjacent anti-node is lambda over 4. So you take one of these expressions and you subtract it from its uh, counterpart um, uh, node position and then you'll get, get lambda over 4. So this section on standing waves has been very interesting because we've made use of uh, pictures and um, the superposition principle and then we've sort of intuitively seen how different waves add together to give standing waves and then we've also looked at the maths and we've come up with a lot of sine and cosine functions which we've analyzed in a sense it's been like a gym for our mind if you want to go to the to the conventional gym and work on your body that's a good thing to do but if you want to to take your mind to the gym and strengthen your mind then you can take a look at the section on standing uh, waves. Right, so now we look at an example. This example says consider uh, the waves in figure 18.8 .8 to be waves on a stretched string. Define the velocity of elements of the string as positive if they are moving upwards in the figure. So what they're saying is the string has a number of different points and each of these we are going to refer to as elements. Now remember, each of the elements is either moving upwards, or it's going to be moving downwards, or it's not going to be moving at all. Um, at, uh, for part one of the question, at the moment the string has the shape shown by the red-brown curve in figure 18.8a. What is the instantaneous velocity of the elements along the string? Is it A, zero for all elements? be positive for all elements which would mean all the little elements are moving upwards c negative for all elements are they all moving downwards or would it vary along the length of the string well at time t equals zero this waveform is in its maximum displacement and that will mean that each of these uh, points have just arrived at their at their sort of 
maximum displacement and their instantaneous velocity is going to be zero. So for part one of the question, the answer is going to be A, zero for all elements. For part two of the question, they say, for the same choice at the moment the string has shape shown by the red-brown curve in figure 18.8b, what is the instantaneous velocity of the elements of the string? So here we can see we have the case where the, the wave is um, flat, flat lined, but it would like to return to some shape similar to this shown. It would like to return to some sinusoidal shape, right? As time goes by, the standing wave would like to return to a sinusoidal shape. So this means that some of these elements will need to be moving up and others will need to be moving down. So what we'll have is some will be moving up and others will be moving down such that as time goes by, we'll have some sine wave again being established. So this means that the solution to question two is D. It will vary with the position of, of the elements, with some moving up and others moving down. Here's a problem to do with uh, standing waves. It says two waves travel in opposite directions to produce a standing wave. The individual wave functions are given by y1 and y2. Let's, let's check these two, two functions and see if they uh, meet the conditions for, for a standing wave. We see that they both have the same amplitude. They both have the same wave number k, 3. And they both have the same omega. Omega is going to be 2. But this one has a minus sign, which means that it's moving towards the right. This one has a plus sign, so it's moving towards the left. So indeed, we have two equal waves traveling in the opposite directions, where x and y are measured in centimeters and t's in seconds. Then we ask to A, find the amplitude of the simple harmonic motion of the element of the media located at x equals uh, 2.3 centimeters. So what's going to be happening is these two waves are going to be adding up together to give us a, a standing wave and we want to know what is the amplitude going to be at this position x equals 2.3 for the resultant uh, standing wave. So looking at the solution then as I said we can take our two waves and we can extract the, the various parameters. So we can see that A is going to be 4. Uh, k is going to be 3 radians per centimeter and omega is going to be 2 radians per second. For a standing wave, we saw that the expression for a standing wave is given by this. We remember everything in front of the omega t term is the amplitude. So this is going to represent the amplitude. So this is the general expression that we derived. And now what we do is we substitute A equals 4 centimeters. Um, k equals 3 radians per centimeter and omega equals 2 radians per second. But the question is so the question is asking us to find the amplitude of the uh, resultant wave at a me at a location of x equals 2.3 centimeters. So what we have here is a general expression for the wave. But if we want to know what is the amplitude at x equals 2.3 centimeters, then we need to uh, substitute 2.3 centimeters in, into the expression. And the solution that we get is that the maximum, uh, well, the amplitude is y equals to 4.6 centimeters. So that's the solution for A. You'll note that I've, uh, I've worked completely in uh, centimeters, which is fine. If you wanted to, you could also have converted everything to meters. Then you would need to have convert the four centimeters to meters. You would have to convert the K, which is in radians per centimeter, to radians per meter. Um, omega would remain the same. That doesn't contain a length uh, measurement.
The second part of the question is we asked to find the position of the nodes and anti-nodes if one end of the string is at x equals to zero. So one of the, the conditions that we derived was for anti-nodes to occur, we need to have this condition holding x is equal to n lambda over 2 where you know n is equal to 0 1 2 so to 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 complete the solution all we need to do is find out what lambda is and then substitute it in here well we've already been told that the k that the wave number is equal to 3 radians per centimeter and remember k is equal to 2 pi over lambda so this allows us to 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 say 2 pi over lambda is equal to 3 and this allows us to rearrange then and find that lambda is equal to 2 pi over 3 and once we know what lambda is we can substitute that in and then we find out the condition for uh, nodes so for zero points is x is equal to n pi over 3 where n is equal to 0 1 2 for anti-nodes, similarly, we make use of the condition that we derived previously, and that condition is x is equal to n lambda over 4, where n is equal to 1, 3, and 5. Again, we use the value for lambda that we uh, found and substitute it in there, and the solution that we get is x is equal to n pi over 6, where n is 1, 3, and 5. So in the beginning, we spoke up a little bit about boundary conditions and quantization. And now we're going to look more uh, into those concepts in detail. So uh, we're going to be considering a string of length L fixed at both ends. So we have a string of length L and it's tied at each end. There's a boundary condition for the waves on the string. Because the ends of the string are fixed, they must necessarily have zero displacement so what's happening at the boundaries what's happening at the two boundaries at the two walls is these two points are tied tight and that means that they're unable to move so they're unable to be displaced so the strings are fixed there and at those points they must have zero displacement they are therefore nodes by definition this condition fixes the wavelength of the standing wave that can occur on the string. So these boundary conditions, as we're going to see, they result in the string having a number of discrete natural patterns of oscillation that can occur called normal modes. This word discrete means that there are only certain oscillations or patterns that can occur in the in the string it isn't possible to have any any natural pattern the situation in which only certain frequencies of oscillation are allowed is called quantization so what we have is we have certain boundary conditions the rope is fixed here because of that these points can't move and this gives rise to only certain frequencies being allowed to exist within the string uh, which we call quantization looking into this uh, in more detail if you if you try for your on your own and you draw different wave patterns such that um, you know only these two points need to be fixed that these two points need to be uh, remain the same then you find that uh, the different patterns you can draw is First, a pattern where we have half a wavelength existing. Um, you can see there's half a wavelength. If this were to continue, it would, you know, be a full wavelength. So we have the length L is equal to half a wavelength. This can be drawn in either this way or going downwards. Another way you could draw it is you could have um, the distance L, and this could be equal to one uh, wavelength here we have one wavelength fitting in the space between the two walls here's another case again we have a separation of l and what we've done is we've drawn now one wavelength 
plus another half. This corresponds to one and a half wavelengths, either drawn in an upward position or in a, in a downward uh, position. So if you generalize each of these expressions shown here at the bottom, we can write them generally as the wavelengths of the normal mode, lambda n is equal to 2L over n, where n is equal to 1, 2, or 3. And n refers to the nth normal mode of the oscillation. So we know that the frequency is equal to the velocity divided by wavelength. So we can make use of this fact and combine it with this equation. And this gives us F subscript N is equal to N times velocity over 2L. These are what's referred to as the natural frequency or the normal modes of the wave speed um, along, along the length of string. And you'll note that they quantized. Um, you can either have a half a wavelength or you can have one wavelength or you can have one and a half wavelengths. You can't have any any value. You know, in in the expression that we found, we found n either needs to be one or two or three. It can't be any any value. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to use the relationship for the um, the velocity of the, or the speed of the wave in terms of the tension and mu, which remember is the mass per unit length. We combine these two. Uh, equations substituting in for for velocity and by doing so we can express the natural frequencies as 2 pi over L square root of tension over mu where n is equal to 1 2 and 3 so as I said the fact that n's a, an integer refers to the quantization if we refer to the case where n equals to 1, then we have what's known as the fundamental frequency of, of the, the taut string. So substituting n equals 1, we have f1 is equal to 1 over 2L square root of t over mu. The frequencies of the remaining normal modes are inter, integral, integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. So this is to say that um, f2 is 2 times this, f3 is 3 times this, f4 is 4 times this, and so forth. Frequencies of normal modes that exhibit such an integer multiple relationship form a harmonic series. So you can arrange, if you arrange f1 followed by f2, f3, you'll be uh, forming the harmonic uh, series. The normal modes are called the harmonics. The fundamental frequency F1 is the frequency of the first harmonic and note that um, F2 is 2 times F1, F3 is 3 times F1. In general, Fn will be n times F1, which is the nth harmonic. Um, an overtone refers to any frequency greater than the fundamental frequency. So F1, given by this expression, is the fundamental frequency. Any frequency greater than F1, that's to say F2, F3, F4, is referred to as an overtone. Um, another phenomenon that we need to, to be aware of is beating. And beating is the periodic variation in the amplitude at a given point due to the superposition of two waves having slightly different frequencies. Here you can see the green wave and the blue wave, they have slightly different frequencies. Uh, this means that, you know, as time goes by, it might happen that they overlap in some positions perfectly. At other positions, there might be destructive interference and they cancel out. And in this case, we get what's referred to as beats and an envelope packet that are beats. Beats are formed by the combination of two waves of slightly different frequencies. Um, again, A shows the individual uh, waves and B shows the combined wave. 
uh, the envelope or the wave dash line represents the beating of the combined sound remember we said previously that we can apply this theory to musical instruments it can either be string based instruments such as a guitar or it can be um, air based instruments such as a flute or trombone and now we look at an example with a piano it says the middle c string on a piano has a fundamental frequency of 262 hertz and the string for the first a above the middle c is a fundamental frequency of 40, 440 hertz so these uh but they're referring to the middle c and the first a these are just different notes on the piano right and then we asked to calculate the frequency of the next two harmonics of the c string and if the a and the c strings have the same linear mass density mu and length l determine the ratio between the tension of the two strings in the piano. So the way we tackle this uh, problem is by making some uh, diagram and sketching the information that we've uh, been given. So I'm not an expert and don't really know anything about music, but still able to, to solve this problem. So the first uh, piano string or note that we've given, piano string, refers to the C, and the second one's the A. We given that for each of them, their fundamental frequency is going to be 262 hertz for the C and 440 hertz for the A. So if we ask to calculate the the frequencies of the next two harmonics for for the C string, then remember F1 is going to be this 262 that we given. F2, the second harmonic, is going to be um, two times the first harmonic. And similarly, F3 is going to be three times the first harmonic. So that's the solution for, for part A. Secondly, we told if strings A and C have the same linear mass density mu and length L, determine the ratio of the tensions in each of the strings. Here we make use of the expression for the fundamental frequency in terms of the length of the cavity and the tension. So uh, the notation that I've used is the fundamental frequency for string A is going to be 1 over 2 L, L is the length of the, the, the column, the length uh, of the, the chamber. And uh, T is going to T A is going to be the tension of string A. Similarly, we can uh, set up uh, an equivalent expression for the fundamental frequency of string C. Uh, we asked to calculate the um, the ratio of the two tensions. So to find the ratio, we take the one equation and we divide it by the other equation. You can see that. A lot of the terms are going to cancel out. Both have 1 over 2L. And um, when we bring this uh, square root of TC over mu to the top, we uh, invert it. So this is the square root of mu over TC. That's why that's inverted. I've, I've brought it from the denominator to the numerator. And then we get the ratio of the fundamental frequencies is equal to the square root of the tensions but in the question we asked to calculate the ratio of the tensions so what we need to do is find out what is ta over tc so we can just square both sides of the equation and then we get ta over tc is f the fundamental frequency of a divided by the fundamental frequency of c squared well, we given given these two values as 440 hertz and 262 hertz respectively. So we substitute it in to the equation, and the final solution we find for part B is that the ratio of the tensions is 2.82. We take a look at resonance, and resonance occurs whenever we have a reinforcement of a natural frequency. So as shown in this figure, what happens is we have some string. The string will have a natural 
um, frequency and then this blade will be vibrating if the frequency of the vibration of the blade matches uh, the natural frequency of the string then we have what's called resonance and the amplitude of the resultant motion of the string is greatest when the frequency of the applied force is equal to one of the natural frequencies of the system this phenomena is known as resonance and the frequencies at which this occur are uh, referred to as the resonance frequencies um, you remember on the first slide we saw an example of a speaker sound from a speaker breaking a glass and that was because the the resonance frequencies of the glass cavity was matched by that of the speaker sound so the 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 energy in the in the glass built up until finally the glass uh, broke due to due to resonance the next topic which we're going to be looking at is standing waves in columns or pipes if you think of the end of a pipe there really are two options the first option is that the end is open and the second option is that the end of the pipe is closed if we look at the case where the pipe is closed at the end the closed end of the pipe is a displacement anti a displacement node if you look uh, remember what that word means a node means a, a sort of a zero point and displacement refers to the motion of the air because the the, the pipe is closed at the end the air isn't going to be able to move out of the pipe right so that's why the displacement there will be zero and it's a displacement node so the reason why it's a displacement node this is because the rigid barrier does not allow uh, longitudinal motion motion of the air previously in the course we saw that whenever we have a displacement um, you know node then we have a pressure anti-node so it's to say if we have a, a displacement uh, minimum we have a pressure maximum so at the at the end of a closed pipe we have a pressure anti-node a pressure maximum a point of maximum pressure variation if we move on then and look at the case of a pipe open at one end the open end of a pipe is a displacement anti-node so that's a displacement maximum thus the open end of a pipe is a pressure node because remember the pressure needs to be opposite to the displacements um, the end of the pipe is open to the atmosphere thus the pressure at the end must remain constant and at atmospheric pressure that's an explanation of why these two statements are, are true let's take a look at the waves that can be set up under different conditions in a pipe so the first uh, option is that we have a pipe and the pipe is open at uh, both ends so this first column refers to that case we have a pipe which is open at both ends as we've um, just uh, seen if we have a pipe which is uh, open at an end then we need to have a displacement anti-node so that's to say at the end of the pipe we need to have a maximum uh, displacement it can't be a uh, zero so if we have that boundary condition where at this point the the displacement must be a uh, maximum we can have a wave like this one shown here or we can have a wave uh, such as this one shown here note that when we draw these waves we draw in the displacement um, you can see that this corresponds to half a wavelength so we have L is equal to half lambda 1 or lambda is equal to 2, 2L then we can use the definition that frequency is equal to lambda times sorry velocity is equal to lambda times frequency we can then rewrite this expression as frequency 1 the fundamental frequency is equal to v over 2l that represents this first uh, case secondly we uh, have 
of course again the two ends of the pipe are open at both ends we apply the boundary condition such that at the end points there must be uh, a maximum an anti-node and here we see we're able to fit a full wave in right you can either draw it like that or we can draw the wave like this but in both cases we have a full wave uh, fitting in the pipe so here we have the condition that lambda is equal to L. Again, we can use the expression V is equal to lambda times frequency. And we arrive at the second harmonic or the second, uh, the second harmonic is 2 times F1. The third harmonic will occur once again when we have the boundary condition of um, the endpoints being a maximum, an antinode. But here we can see we have a one wave plus another half a wave. So we have one and a half lambda is equal to L or lambda is equal to 2 over 3 L, which corresponds to F3, the third harmonic being 3 V1 over 2 L, which is three times the first harmonic. So this deals with the, 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 the case of a pipe being um, open at both ends and the boundary condition being that we need to have an anti-node at both ends. Secondly, we can look at the condition in this row where we have a pipe which is open at one end and closed at the other end. We've already seen for our pipe being open at, at this end being open we have to have an anti-node. From this side, we know that at the end where the pipe is closed, we have a displacement node. So a displacement zero. So in the, our diagram, in each, each end of the pipe on this end, it's closed. And we have a displacement node, a displacement zero. And the way we can satisfy these conditions is either by drawing the wave like uh, this, or drawing the wave like uh, this, or drawing the wave like this, and so it could uh, continue. And what we do is we do a similar analysis. Over here we can see what we've actually drawn is a quarter of a wavelength. We would need to continue and we got to here, we would be at a half a wavelength. Here we would be at three quarters. Here we, we then return to, to a full wavelength. But um, I digress, the wavelength shown here is a quarter of a wavelength. So this means that um, one quarter of lambda is equal to L or lambda is equal to 4L. This corresponds to a frequency, a fundamental frequency of V over 4L for the, for the first harmonic and the pipe open at one end and closed at the other end. For the second wave, we see what we have is we have um, three quarters of a wave fitting in length L. So we would have three over four times lambda is equal to L or lambda is equal to four over three L. When we rewrite this in terms of frequency, then we get this is equal to three V over four L over 4L. Remember before we had V over 4L for the first harmonic. So here what we have is three times the first harmonic, right? There's a three there. So this means that we have a third harmonic F3 is equal to three times F1. So this is quite interesting because for the pipe um, open at one end and closed at the other end, we don't have a second harmonic. We just have a first harmonic and then a third harmonic. And if we look at the next case and we draw the wave as shown here and we, you know, analyze the situation as before, we would find that lambda is equal to 4 over 5L. Again, this is 5 times V over 4L. It's 5 times the first harmonic. So that means that this must be the fifth harmonic. So 
for for this case of the pipe open at one end and close at the other end we have the first harmonic the fifth harmonic sorry the first harmonic the third harmonic the fifth harmonic next we'll have the seventh harmonic and so forth odd numbered harmonics occurring if we summarize what we've just seen we've seen that the natural frequency of a pipe open at both ends uh, is given by this expression here fn is equal to n times v over 2l where n is equal to 1 2 3 again note that it's quantized and these are the the quanta that, that, that are allowed these are the values that n can can take on in the pipe open at both ends the natural frequencies of oscillation form a harmonic series that include all integral multiples of the fundamental frequency if we look at the second case we uh, studied the natural frequency of a pipe closed at one end and open at the other end then we have an expression fn is equal to n times v over 4l where the quanta allowed aren't uh, all the integers but only the odd numbered integers so in a pipe closed at one end the natural frequency of oscillation form a harmonic series that include only odd integral multiple numbers of fundamental of the fundamental frequency here's an example the example says a pipe open at both ends resonates at a fundamental frequency f open uh, when one end is covered the pipe is again made to resonate the fundamental frequency is f closed which of the following expression describe how these two resonant frequencies compare is it f closed is equal to f open f closed is equal to half f open um, do they differ by a factor of two or two over three three over two let's take a look then we need to use the relevant um, equations with the relevant um, quanta included so if the pipe is open at uh, both ends then the the frequency the fundamental frequency will be um, 1 times v over 2l if the pipe is closed at one end and open at the other end it will be given by 1 times um, v over 4 uh, l and you'll notice what we can do is we can can uh, take this expression and we would like to write it as something similar to this expression so we split it up into two uh, v over 4l can be written as half of v over 2l the reason why i wrote it like this is you can see v over 2l this is actually f open so instead of this v over 2l i can write f open so the relationship we have is f closed is equal to half f open and looking at the the options we have this corresponds to option b which is the solution if we look at the second uh, problem this asks about a baseball park that has an outdoor organ if you hear the word organ it refers to um, uh, something that's similar to a piano like a piano that's used in churches or apparently at this baseball park as well um, when the air temperature increases the fundamental frequency of one of the organ pipes a stays the same b goes down c goes up or d is impossible to to determine so remember what's going to happen is when the temperature changes when the temperature increases the speed of the um, air the speed of the sound in the air is going to change and as a result of that uh, the the frequency is going to change so if we take a look at uh, what happens then um, velocity is equal to fre frequency times lambda so we see that the frequency is proportional to to the velocity we've seen in chapter 17 that the speed of sound in air depends on the temperature and this is in fact the expression that applies so if the temperature increases then it means that the this term inside the square root is going to get bigger and overall the speed of the sound is going to increase right 
so if the temperature in Celsius goes up, then the velocity increases and the frequency also increases because it's proportional to the velocity. So the answer to this problem is C. This example then concludes this chapter on standing waves and the superposition of waves.